Ready. Good evening, everyone. Um, we'll start off the meeting. Welcome. Um, it looks like we have enough members. Um, today we're going to be looking at um, public safety, um, and I will uh, kick it right off with uh, with SEMREC. Um, I just have, forgive me, I, I don't have the name of the uh, director of SEMREC, but I do have, uh, is that, would that be yourself, Rob? Good evening, yeah, that, that's me. All right, awesome. Uh, good guess. I kind of like, kind of want to name my name there. Um, so uh, we'll kick it off with you. If you'd like to uh, present, you can uh, share your screen. Sure. And um, whenever you're ready. Excellent. Let me see if this works. <clears throat> Perfect. Excellent. Can you see the uh, presentation? Yes, but I think we're seeing what you're seeing. So with this slide and then this slide on the side. Um, I, I can see fine. If it, Actually, that's better, I think. Um, if anyone has any trouble uh, viewing the presentation, certainly speak up. Yeah. I'll just switch it. See this way. Okay. How's that? Perfect. Excellent. Well, thank you for having me today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back in front of the AdCom. Uh, just a, I'm a slide or two ahead here. My apologies. Dr. Dunn, the executive director of the Southeastern Massachusetts Regional 91 District. Uh, Southeastern Massachusetts 91 District uh, hosts and operates SEMREC, the Southeastern Massachusetts Regional Communica uh, Emergency Communication Center, which is our operation center, uh, PSAP, and uh, the facility up at High Rock and Foxboro. Uh, this is a brief overview of our org chart. It's a little complicated to explain right now, but just figured I'd give a, a brief overview. Uh, we I report to a board of directors who's our oversight committee. Uh, I have a deputy director who assists me in my duties. Uh, we have two section chiefs who operate our two divisions, training and operations, and then four squads with supervisors. We have a medical director, training officers, attorneys, and accountants, etc. Uh, just a brief overview of what we did last year. Uh, we did about 100 uh, total cat entries, which is our calls for service in our computer system, um, and about 58,000 911 calls. Uh, originally, when we set out to, to establish SEMREC and uh, start the district, we were projected to receive about 23,000 911 calls. Um, and over the years, since 2017, when this is formed to today, just the modernization of technology, the, the prevalence of cell phones, um, the way people actually communicate and utilize 911 has increased our call line by uh, a considerable margin. Uh, we maintain strict standards um, and we, we're proud to, you know, average ring time for our PSAP is three seconds for last year. We're just under two and a half seconds now. Um, and this is kind of an overview of what we um, saw for last year for calls. It's just another view of the same thing. See, Foxborough's got quite a bit, quite a bit of traffic. Um, lots on the highways, lots of Gillette, and lots of the center of each community. So, just a, a look back to this was one of my slides I used pre go live and kind of how we were establishing uh, Samarak. And one of the uh, I thought important slides to understand the finances on the, the, the grant side of the house um, and why regionalization financially is very. Um, advantageous for communities and incentivized for the state. So pre SEMREC go live, each community or the communities collectively were bringing in about $190,000 in grant money annually uh, combined. So Foxborough was annually bringing in $43,534 to apply towards the operation of their 911 center. Um, and we projected that after go live, um, we would receive about uh, $890,000 um, which would represent over a period of 10 years about a $6.9 million uh, abandonment if the communities, the four communities didn't reach on us. Um, and just an important note, the, the, the grant programs in the Commonwealth are not tax based there. I'll explain how those work in a bit. Um, fast forward to 2022 and 2023, um, that number, the $800,000 has turned into $1.7 million of annual grant revenue. And that's largely based off of 
Uh, there's a small increase in the surcharge amount, but also our, our call volume uh, reflects um, a higher operational load and, and therefore an increase in our grant allocation. And what that represents over a period of 10 years is not a $6.9 million uh, abandoned grant. It's a, a, about $13.1 million of a grant, abandoned grant money over, over a 10-year period. Um, and that adjusts for the increase that uh, a local community would have seen in uh, the, the individual assessment. So Fox World went from about $43,000 a year to about $60,000 a year. Um, Rob, Rob uh, where are the grants coming from? Oh, I can't. Uh, it's a couple of slides. I'll show you in just a second, if you, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, so as far as uh, assessments, uh, we projected an assessment to each community um, at uh, about $580,000 annually. Um, the assessments are built off of our total operating costs, uh, less any grant revenue or other revenue, and then split by a four, almost the four communities. Uh, this year, uh, we're projecting $300,000. And last year, or this current fiscal year, was also $300,000. So a great savings. Um, we're, we're, we keep trying to push that number back um, and maintain that 300 k uh, Our goal is to get as close to zero to the communities as possible. And we'll do that through um, the Commonwealth reducing the amount of PCAPs seen across the, the state and also adding communities, dilutes both the cost share and increases our grant funding. So uh, both combined, we're hoping to hedge against um, both, you know, our, our natural cost increases, you know, staff increases and raises and cost of fuels and power and stuff, and continue to move that number out of the pockets of the communities and into the pockets of the state as far as uh, utilizing the, the grants and the, uh, the surcharge money. Uh, just a quick rundown of what our, our budgeting process looks like. So as the executive director, I present the recommended budget to the board of directors. Um, the board of directors on first Glance either recommends it or does not recommend it, it'd go to our finance committee. If the board of directors recommends the, the uh, budget to go to finance committee, our finance committee, which is a separate uh, body, uh, reviews the uh, projected or the uh, proposed budget. And if they see it fit, they can approve it or reject it. Um, obviously, if it's rejected, it goes back into the, the process. Uh, and once the finance committee approves the, the budget, it goes back to the board of directors for final adoption and appropriation. Um, so the grant money that we talk about largely, um, we're eligible for a bunch of different grants, but the, the big money grants are the state 901, uh, 901 grants. The 901 grants in Massachusetts are protected by law. They're derived exclusively from the surcharges off of any uh, phone line. So if you ever look at your phone bill, there's a surcharge um, on there. It's a dollar twenty-five, I believe now. All that money comes into the state 901 department is put into a trust fund and is protected under federal and state law. So it can't, the 901 surcharge money cannot be used for repairing potholes, um, for building schools. That money is exclusively set aside and protected for provisioning 901 and providing the services that we provide. Um, these grants are perpetual, they're required. Um, the state, state can't not do it one year uh, unless there's a, a sweeping federal and state change in law. Um, and the way that the, the state has provisioned their grants program and protected it, uh, regional emergency communication centers like ours are uh, very much favored in the allocation, as you can see in the, um, the, the local versus regional allocation that I explained earlier. Um, we are also eligible for other grants. We apply for grants as they come up. Uh, we're, we're always seeking funds that are not tax derived or not locally derived. Um, that includes Homeland Security grants. Uh, various FEMA grants, uh, local and state eligible, uh, like community compact grants and, and the like. Um, we received a grant this year from our uh, insurance provider for providing health and wellness equipment for our staff. Did that answer your question? I apologize. Yes, yes. So, so Massachusetts right now um, has about 241 centers. Uh, we just got the report yesterday, so I fresh numbers. Um, we are the third highest uh, state for the amount of PSAPs, and a PSAP is a public safety answering point or a 911 center. Um, so Massachusetts is the third in line for most 911 centers in a state. So first is California, second is Texas. California has a population of, I believe, about 50 million. 
Uh, Texas is about 40 million, and then Massachusetts is about 6 million with the third highest amount of PSAS or 911 centers. So the state um, is really pushing to say uh, it's, it's time to uh, conform with the industry best practices and the best thing for the public safety, which is larger consolidated regional 911 centers that can handle and uh, uh, dedicate the appropriate resources and staff and um, time to really making sure that they do a great job versus um, local centers, which also do a great job and they really try very hard, but they're just generally strapped for resources. Um, so having a larger center gives us the ability to really dedicate those resources and improve training, um, latest technologies and provide a great service to the community. Uh, so this is a, a, a map of what has been done in the Commonwealth so far. We're the big uh, purple heart in the middle of uh, Southeast Mass there. And you can see Western Mass is really uh, adopted by and far regionalization. And as we get closer to Boston, it's a little um, less prevalent. Um, we are one of the largest 911 centers, one of the largest recs in the Commonwealth. Some are bigger uh, square miles wise, but their populations um, are you know, a fraction of ours. Uh, just a closer view of us uh, when compared against Bristol County. Uh, so we are the, right now we're the only rec in Bristol County. And I, I don't expect to see any other uh, regional centers pop up in Bristol County. The state has taken a pretty firm stance um, as far as um, no more new centers and just expanding the investments in the, the centers that are already existing. So that's really all I had. I just want to take the opportunity to, you know, have a shameless plug if anyone needs or thinks they need help. Uh, 911 wants the, the number to call. Um, you should never need to look up a number or dial a seven digit number to get help. Uh, our staff is there to help. If you have a, if you, if you even think you might need 911, um, please call us and we'll figure it out from there. I should never be afraid to call 911. If you can't, Call us for whatever reason. You could text 911 as well in the Commonwealth. Um, we prefer phone calls, just a, a, a lot smoother of a process. But if there's a situation where you can't talk to us, uh, you can text 911 in the Commonwealth. Uh, if you want more information about us, you can visit semrec.gov um, and all of our social media is at semrec911. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Dennis, do you have a question? <clears throat> Yeah, uh, Rob, uh, is Semrick involved in the uh, response times, police, fire, ambulance, our uh, town, and, you know, uh, what, you know, what the average times are in each community and stuff like that? Uh, so, yeah, we, we handle, um, or at least we capture tabulate um, our handling calls, so from first ring to dispatch. Um, we also help the communities with determining their dispatch to first responder, to dispatch to on scene, uh, shoot times, um, fastest routes. We do a lot of analytical data and a lot, a lot of analysis of our data. Um, and it's provided in the form of maps, dashboards, real time alerts, and those kinds of things. Right. So if there are any patents where, you know, like with uh, Norwood Hospital being closed, mm -hmm. are there any patents where that's affecting Foxborough and run times uh, for Foxborough and are there any recommendations that might come out of that kind of analysis? Sure. So uh, we did that when Ward Hospital was, uh, you know, destroyed in the storm. Uh, we actually took, started taking our data and started to analyze that um, between COVID, the staffing shortages um, across the board, and then you know removing a hospital, one of the primary hospitals from that response and uh, delivery care. Uh, working with Chief Keller, um, we started providing not only how long it's taking for ambulance to transit to a hospital, um, but also what the turnaround times at hospitals are. Um, we track that in real time. So every hour we analyze um, where all of our ambulances went from which parts of the towns. We look at the turnaround times from the hospital. So when the ambulance actually gets there to when it actually clears and comes back, uh, as well as uh, transit time. Uh, so from the scene to the hospital and back in service. Um, we, we, derived what percentage of the ambulances are in town and service compared to where they were um, pre uh, Norwood Hospital. Right off line. I don't want to step on Chief Keller's toes too much if he was uh, planning on speaking about that, but um, because we, we captured this so uh, consistently and we captured so much data, we're, we're pretty easily able to write um, analysis like that. And uh, we actually just have like a, a dashboard up in our center that, that tracks like a scoreboard. Uh, it looks like little gas gauges of each hospital and their turnaround times are. Because uh, not only were we concerned with the actual extended travel time, but 
if we're overload or putting additional patients into ERs, their staffs were used to you know, X amount of patients today. All of a sudden, there's a hospital missing, it's a giant gap. So, you know, really trying to derive how much that's impacting the hospitals as well as, you know, just drive time in general. So, yes, we are uh, we're looking at all those things. All right. Thank you. Question on uh, uh, you have in the past said that you're looking to add additional towns to your system beyond the current four. How does that exp um, affect response time? Adding one town won't. Adding 10 time towns, uh, does that change the response time significantly? Uh, I would say it, it changes the response time. So if we contemplated taking on any community, we wouldn't do so if it impacted our ability or degraded our ability to service any of our current communities. So that's one of our firm um, kind of tenets of taking on a community is we won't, if it, if it doesn't fit for us, we don't fit for the community, or if it affects, you know, if we take on a community and it just totally hamstrings us, it's not worth anybody's time or effort to do that. Um, so as we take on communities, we uh, kind of determine what that, um, impact is to our center, and then we add staff and support and technology to make sure that each community, each night one call is treated with the same level of attention to detail and uh, dedicated resources. So to add a community, no, it just kind of iterates um, and grows. Um, so each call is treated exactly the same. And if we don't have the resources to take on the town safely, we won't do it. I have, I have a question, Rob, on you. Um, so at every shift, do you have a representative from each of the four towns there to take the, uh, the calls or how does that work? No, so it's our staff. Uh, we are the district hires and employees, a, a professional staff of uh, communications officers and supervisors. Um, so we take every call, we assign each piece, we hand calls from, you know, somebody calling 911 or texting 911 to dispatching and assigning resources to them coming back in service and everything in between. Um, so there's no town employees in our, in our building. It's all district employees, and okay. our staff is trained and interacts with them. Just as another service, just like uh, a hospital directs with the, the fire department or the uh, the judicial. So, so are they paid from um, your expenses, or how are they or from the grants? Those uh, so, the district employees. Correct. So they're paid from our general budget. Um, oh. Part of which is largely funded through the grant program. The other part is to pass through uh, assessments to the communities. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, the allocation to the towns. What is the allocation based on the population or the number of calls from that town or what? Uh, neither. So right now, each of our four communities, the, uh, the district was chartered was um, they did a lot of legwork to see what works and what doesn't work and what kind of gets uh, convoluted for the, the year. So right now, uh, our, our assessments are based off of our total operating budget less out any revenue, and then divide it by four. So it's an even split. And that uh, really correlates to actual operational impact as well. Now, if we take on another community, they'll be assessed for, um, or like they'll be uh, analyzed for how much of an impact they have. And if it's equal parts to the communities now, I'm sure they'll be in a very similar spot. If there's a, a large increase, um, let's see, uh, if they're double the operation of our current four communities, I'm sure their uh, assessment will reflect that. Or if there are a small percentage of our operation, I'm sure that will reflect that way as well. But right now, it's even, even split uh, by four. Hi, Rob. Um, John Mahoney, anyone, uh, any towns close to coming on board or uh, kind of doing the paperwork to get there? Or are, are there no current takers? Uh, we have quite a list right now. Um, some are closer than others. Uh, so we're working through that process. We have a little bit of work left to do on our side as far as uh, charter uh, modernization to make sure that that process is efficient. Uh, but yeah, we have quite a quite a line. Um, I think the communities are really seeing that uh, the industry is modernizing to the point where a local operation is just not able to be uh, supported. Uh, for sure. In, are you competing with the Norfolk Center to get, say, North Attleboro or Walpole? Is it, you know, are those communities kind of can to choose who they go for, or is, is there something you need to incentivize them to go with you instead of the other one? Uh, yeah, so it's every community right now, there's no state mandate that you go to one center or another. So, uh, what we've been seeing is that communities come and they interact with us, and they, they we basically do them, they do us, and they go to the various different uh regional centers. Um, we do business one way, Norfolk County Control does it a little differently. Uh, we have various capabilities that they do or do not have, and vice versa. So 
uh, community skill kind of shop. Uh, I hate to say like business because we're you know we're a public safety entity. We're not a we're not a corporation. Um, but they get to kind of see which center they culturally and operationally fit best with, and then they can petition to join that center. Okay, thank you. Uh, we kind of work very well together amongst the centers to say, hey, this is a better fit for you or not. We had a uh, a South Shore a community up near Boston that was looking to join us. And we said, we can take you, but there's a center that's probably a better fit for you when it was in uh, Duxbury, so. Great, thanks. Uh, Bill, anything to add? So thank you, uh, thank you, Dan. I just, I just, uh, Rob is, uh, is, a, is a bit of a modest guy in many ways because he, you know, when he's on, he really has uh, not really spoken about what kind of effort that is taken to actually bring this to where it is. It currently uh, sits in fruition uh, over time. This has been about a, about an eight year effort to get to this point, uh, maybe even longer in some cases. But um, when, we, when, it was, when it was started out, it was. Uh, a discussion about it was first going to be a discussion about where it's going to be located. Originally going to be located in Mansfield. And it's a really interesting story about how we ended up on, on, at High Rock Hill. But I think um, to, to do justice to what this center is all about, I think it would be it would behoove you and, and Rob could probably do this to set up a time so you could actually all see it in, in, in motion because the the center itself is extraordinary. It's probably one of the top. Uh, technology centers anywhere in the country. Um, the, uh, the the level of technology they have is, is stuff that you that would I would say would would rival it to something like at NASA. It's it's that it's that high level. So it's really um, they they they're it's everything state of the art. They uh, they use the they they considered to be one of the best models in the state. In fact, State nine one one actually looks to Semrec all the time as as the model as to how they should do it. So. Um, I don't think any of us uh, on the board, I, I currently serve as chairman of the board. I've been on, I've served, I'm chairman of the board for the past four years. And um, we none of us actually envisioned us being in a position where we would not only see the success of this, but also the savings to the town is extraordinary. And I think it's one of the best kept secrets in many ways. But, you know, to, to look at this from a purely financial perspective, uh, we were spending close to a million dollars a year just running dispatch out of, out of the police and fire department. We're now spending three hundred thousand for a far better product than we ever had before, um, and and don't have any of the headaches we have to deal with. Uh, Rob deals with everything with his own staff, and um, you know he's done all the hiring and firing, and, and it deals with all the the issues that go with that, and dealing with the state as well. What's interesting too is is the fact that during the whole process of, of dismantling uh, dispatch at at uh, in Foxborough. Uh, we offered uh, many of the of the uh, of the current dispatchers the opportunity to interview, and actually only one or two actually did interview. Um, I don't in the end I don't know if I actually hired any of them or not, Rob. I just don't I don't remember if any but any took the took the actual position. But at the end of the day, um, he's got a, a really top notch uh, crew up there that, that works uh, some extraordinary hours to keep the the center running twenty four hours a day. So it's, uh, I do encourage you to see it because uh, it's a marvel in a, of itself to actually see it in operation. Uh, I know that my uh, fellow uh, uh, friends here on, on that are gonna be here tonight, the uh, police chief and fire chief uh, share in, in, uh, in, our, in my uh, satisfaction and praise of, of the operation. It's, it's really, it's quite, quite something to see. So thank you. Great, appreciate that. <laughs> Just wanna interject that uh, Sharon and I had the opportunity to visit there uh, earlier this week, and uh, yes, mm -hmm. very impressive and uh, top-notch operation. It's, it's uh, kind of mind-blowing to see the capabilities that they have to monitor everything that's going on and dispatch and to hear about the training and the capabilities that the, the staff have. Thank you, Miles. Question on uh, what happens when you get a call from somebody who's, let's say, in North Alboro or Sharon. Um, you can't just hang up on them. No, no, we, we certainly just don't hang out on them. Um, so if there's an out-of-jurisdiction call that comes to the center, we have a process to uh, get it to the correct center. Um, the 911 system across the Commonwealth is one big 911 system. So if it's as simple as a, a, a call that's misrouted from North Africa, we get a lot of Brockton calls. Um, if it's nothing that we can help about or it's nothing that's actually dealing with our jurisdiction, we just push a button and off it goes. And they get all the data we have to... Uh, just forward along. If it's something that's acute, that's very urgent, trying to arrest, somebody's a uh, sinking vehicle or somebody's on fire, uh, we'll start uh, mitigation instructions and then the conference in the other center. But that's a very natural process. It happens quite often. 
Did anybody catch what happened to Seal over the weekend that uh, they were actually very, very uh, you know, helpful in, in locating a person that got lost in the Foxborough Forest, the State Forest? Uh, they, they were able to ping the person's, person's phone and they were able to locate the person because uh, they were lost and couldn't, couldn't find their way out in the fire department and the police department were able to, to assist in the uh, rescue of that individual. But uh, due to the, the technology that Summer had, they were able to locate the person fairly quickly. So it was actually it was on Channel 7 News uh, over the weekend. Awesome. Glad they were found safe. Uh, any further questions for Rob? <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate your time. Thank you for presenting to us. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chief Grace. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I do like in person better, but this will have to work. Hopefully, this is the last time um, that we're doing it through Zoom. Um, you you all have the um, the workbook that the town put out. I do have a little um, slideshow that I'll share. A little bit about the department. And excuse me one second. Is that um can everybody see that? Yep. Sorry about that. Um, so real quickly, um I, I won't get too much into the dynamics of, of, of the agency and all the services that we provide, as this is more on, on the budget aspect, but it is important that the residents and, and ADCOM and, and everybody know that the police department is a community-based organization that focuses on community at the same time, keeping the community safe. Um, these are just some of our um, programs that we run with, um, with our staff reaching out. Um, many of these issues, the huge issues that we encounter, especially uh, with mental health issues and sexual assaults that we're seeing um, in the younger generation. Um, we partner with our um, all of our schools, all of our libraries. Our kids are everything to us in the town. We uh, run events all summer. Um, of course, our animal control officer and working for uh, with the vets is um, is key. And our partners up at Patriot Place and the YMCA when they when they host events, we're we're always there. And when the offices um, develop this program to raise. Um, toys for the uh, Foxborough Discretionary Fund. That was our fourth car load. Uh, they almost had to shut us down. It, it's just fantastic how responsive the uh, the officers are to the community and how responsive the community is um, to the department. It's a great partnership. Uh, one thing that um, occurred this year was that the police department um, a C, earned the certification for the mass police accreditation. Now that is, um, it could be a 10 second comment, but the reality is, is 319 cities and towns in Massachusetts, only 98 are accredited, only 19 have been certified. So this has been a goal probably for 25 years for the department that we reached. We now have eight months to get accredited and to be one of those elite agencies in the state. The accreditation guidelines uh, and policies are, are the, the gold standard of policing. So when people ask, how do you do use of force? How do you do investigations? How do you do your hiring? You're meeting all of those standards. And it's important that the residents know that that is what their, their police department is doing. Um, in regards to the budget, um, I'm sorry, the right side is probably cut off. I didn't know where the faces were gonna pop up. So I, I redrafted, um, this is, um, the organizational chart, but what I've added in there is a little bit of our projection of what we're missing in that chart. So obviously um, is the chief and underneath um, myself is my deputy chief. And then currently I run two um, lieutenants. What I'm missing is a third lieutenant to deal with Gillette Stadium planning events and Homeland Security. So that's that position is something that um, um, hopefully will come down the road. Uh, we, under the patrol lieutenant, we have uh, five sergeants and they run the four shifts, uh, the three shifts, the 12 to eight, the eight to four, the four to 12. Um, the administrative lieutenant oversees 
the detectives directly uh, without a detective sergeant. And he also is in charge of um, all the other property, the court officer, the building. He's a liaison with Semerec as we keep building that out. And then we have um, our reserve officer team, which is overseen by one of the sergeants. Uh, we lack a traffic officer. But more importantly, is we actually lack enough patrolmen on a regular basis to manage the shifts without forced overtime. It's It's been a constant, constant issue. And we're really seeing the, the challenge as the younger generation are just not workhorses anymore. No disrespect to them. I think they're probably living healthier lives, but they're just not putting in the extra 20, the extra 30 hours anymore. Um, double income, someone staying at home. Um, guidelines for the budget were very clear. Um, Mike, Mike uh, just related to that that prior chart. So do those, op do those uh, needs represent current openings? Are they things that are in the strategic plan and are, and are planned for in the coming years? And what well, this, the status of this is the beginning of the plan. Let's put it that way. So I'm just giving a little introductory, but I won't get too involved with it. But I just don't. But um, when you when you run your patrol shift, officer for officer, it's it's just unsustainable, especially with the demands. So um, part of the strategic plan which started in about 2018, it never got finished. And now we've just rolled into, as you see with Semerec, um, the amount of work that we've just incur incurred lately, is it just, it's been daunting. The, the calls for service, they're just skyrocketing. So yes, that would be a part of a rollout justifying every one of those positions, clearly. Yeah. Um, again, the budget was very strict, 2.5. Make sure you you um, you meet it um, every year, every budget year. There's a cost analysis done on every single police officer, what their costs are, um, their hourly rate, um, and time off, and and how it is um, affected by the budget. And of course, where does the budget go? Eighty nine percent of it is salaries. Um, Eight percent is expenses, capital outlay, which is my cruises. Three percent, and of the budget, eleven percent currently goes to overtime. Um, and again, here's the, the explanation of the staffing right now. We run one sergeant and four officers per shift. That's a bare minimum. Um, unfortunately, we can't even meet that minimum on the midnight to eight shift on four out of the seven nights because um, Sunday through Thursday. I, I run the, uh, the midnight shift with only two officers on the road and a sergeant. It's not ideal, but you got you to gotta make the budget at the end of the year. Uh, all the sergeants are uh, one for one. When they take a day off, there's no two sergeants ever scheduled on a shift. And one thing is, is the uh, station officer, we talk about summer and the success that it is. And it absolutely is. And I, I'll put a plug here for Rob. Um, I meet with the Norfolk County Chiefs, uh, we, with the Mass Chiefs. His, the, our summer is the model for the state. And what he's done, he is actually, because Massachusetts was anti-regional. It doesn't work. Everybody built dispatch centers in their police buildings. And the reality is, is it, it is the most supportive tool that I've seen in policing in 24 years, without a doubt. And uh, when he's modest, when he says people want to come, they are lining up. We have some issues with data conversions and um, CAD systems before you make the jump. So trying to get all that fixed first, because um, it's, it's very expensive to convert people's data. Um, but when we went to regional dispatch, the police department is the one that had to carry the load of when these two people left the building, who's going to take our walk-ins, who's going to handle all our calls. So the police department was given three people. The problem is three people doesn't cover that position five days, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So we actually lost staff off the road and when we went to regional dispatch. And, and at the time, it was the best compromise we could do. We didn't know how this was going to roll out. As it turned out, it's been the best thing ever, and we're getting more bang for our buck. But some of that savings hopefully will be looked at to say, geez, we should at least bring our staffing levels out on the road back to where it was to pre Um uh, Mike, could you explain that last bullet? Uh, 
Uh, you, you had a couple of uh, CIJIS and uh, Open Fox. Would you explain what those, they mean? Sure. So when we're at the regional dispatch, we're obligated by the state to run our own CGIS network. Um, for many years, police are, and those are all the, um, that's where all our data comes in for running plates throughout the state, throughout the country, warrant hits. All of that, all of our uh, property that's ever get entered into these national databases, we have to do validations, uh, stolen cars, missing persons. So that was a big change because police officers actually had just, the police department had just kind of put it all onto the dispatches. And they were working under the police department's um, agency code. When we went to SEMREC, we are mandated to keep that system and Rob has his own. So now we have to retrain all of our staff up to that level to keep that up. And now Rob's um, team is awesome. And they're, one of their training coordinators helps the new officers learn it, but it's like a different language. So we're mandated to make sure we're answering those. Those come in 24 hours, seven days a week. If there's a hit on a warrant out of North Carolina, there's a response time that has to be submitted. So all of that station officer has to keep doing that work. Um, and when we talk about the budget, overtime seems to be the one that it looks like it's something that's tangible, it's measurable, it's something that's controllable. And this is just a little breakdown, like when we talk about contractual time off. This is people's earned vacation time. They take the day off. We have to backfill the position. If the sergeant takes the day off, I got to backfill it with a supervisor. Um, one thing that we saw is... Um, is their abuse is like is is sick is overtime at least from a taxpayer's perspective is it being spent where it shouldn't be spent and people would say well what's going on with the sick time last year my offices averaged five sick days a year that's it and that includes family sick time the police department right now has 67 children under the age of 17 so they only took five days off this last year, we bumped up to nine. A lot of that was COVID mandates where the offices or their kids were exposed and they had that five-day window and they couldn't come back to work and they were forced to use their own time. Well, that just those five additional days or four days is almost a $50,000 cost to the overtime line item. And it's not abuse, but it's just because the staffing's so thin. There's, there's nothing there to absorb this. Um, so that, that's why I highlighted that right there. Um, but all the other line items are just our, our training. And even our training is as we go through police reform and we meet all the requirements, which we have, and we're up to date on everything across the board, is we're mandated additional training that we have to send them offices to maintain their certification. And it's got to come from somewhere. So it comes out of the training all the time. Uh, and this is um, this year. When I, when, I, when I sat in front of everybody last year, the budget got approved. It looked good. And I automatically lost three, uh, three police officers to the state police. Another officer, him and his wife, moved away. So I lost four. And I ended up with some long-term illnesses. Um, so you, you plan, you plan. But when you're missing eight people on July 1st, it's, uh, it's daunting. So right now, uh, as you can see, the patrol overtime, because, and I and I even had to in, implement a force policy among the members to, to fill the shifts, I'm, I'm, to make them work because we just don't have the bodies. We have since almost recovered. I've got them hired. Um, and I only have two out with long-term injuries and one is wrapping up their FTO. But that also was, with the assistance of leaving civil service in the fall, that I was able to move a little faster. Um, on the police expenses, it, there's an $11,000 increase. 20, uh, 16 items have no increases whatsoever. Um, I did have uh, one of the accounts, I just made another line item, pulling it from existing line, just so I can more accurately document um, equipment spending. Um, the cost of uniforms, um, one of the things when I when I came on board is implementing a new uniform policy um, and making sure that everything, the offices all have the same uniforms, the same equipment. Um, and some of those mandates that I uh, implement, some of them I have to pay for. 
Um, so, and of course, with everything else, the price is going through the roof on some of the equipment. I didn't have an, um, an expense account for the animal control officer. So I uh, have a $1,500 account, as we learned, that when we take in animals from animal abuse cases, we actually become the owner and the custody of that animal. And we're responsible for all the vet bills as well, while that case works its way through court. Um, when we had one of those animals. So, um, and then there was um, the pre-employment and medical um, mandates. So as police reform rolls through in the next, this year, next year, and the third year is my reserve officer team, many of them have been here 18, 20 years, are all gonna be unable to maintain their positions. They're not going to be able to get the 2,500 hours of training because number one is I can't pay them and I don't have open spots for them. And two, they have other jobs. So uh, they're going to leave. So I'm going to now have to try to replace them with maybe some retired police officers, which I've been very lucky reaching out to North Fork County. Um, and but part of the hiring process is a mandate by post to make sure that they all have um, psychological exams and medical backgrounds up to a certain standard. So all of those are a cost. Um, capital outlay, uh, this year we're looking for three mock cruises. Um, I still have two cars outstanding um, that haven't come in from last year. So these cars are sitting around about 78,000 miles. They're five years old. They'll get moved to the detail fleet. That helps me supplement for Gillette. So um, this is probably a little under because the state bid list um, came out and they moved the cars $3,000, but it is what it is. This is what I asked for. So, um, so the bottom line is um, on that budget, that you see in front of you, you'll see that the stipend increase was the biggest um, number that, that popped out. And that was in the fall when we, we left civil service. The agreement was with the, uh, the union was to fully fund their educational incentive. But we didn't ask for any money. And with the hopes of absorbing it out of this year's budget, because it'll only be a half a year, but we do have to pay for it coming this fiscal year. And that's $116,000. Um, and that's a CIP issue with the, um, in which we're not really talking about today, but I will say the last three years, I haven't overspent on any of the, on the budget and I've come, uh, so I hope I can make it as well. Uh, Bill has guaranteed me that money that came out of the, um, the, um, the civil sir, uh, the educational stipend that we knew that it would be kind of close not funding it at town meeting. So we'll see how it goes, but I think we'll make it. And this is this is my little thinking ahead. Um, and I'm gonna go real quick because it's not really part of the budget, but the town has done multiple, multiple studies and every single one of them, no matter how you, how you pick it apart, they paid a lot of money for them, is that at the end of the day, the police department in Fosboro a structure where the deputy, two lieutenants, sergeants is designed not to have a stadium. This is, it's the same as Walpole. It's the same as a regular town. So we have over 64 events tentatively planned already up at Gillette, some smaller, some larger, and that's before the NFL season. So that entity up there and their great partners, they're a full-time job. They need a full-time person working with them with all of the other Homeland Security branches as they, as they develop and as they plan for events. And right now, with myself, a deputy, and two lieutenants, there's only four of us to run these events. And many of these events require all four of us or two of us or three of us. And then you roll in Patriot Place on Saturday and Sunday with all the liquor issues up there. There is no, not enough command staff to long-term sustain the supervision up there. It, it is a burnout for sure, because literally I have to tell my lieutenants that you don't get vacation in July or August because we have so many events planned because I just don't have enough commanders to choose from. And a lot of these, and, and a lot of these studies were 
or since 9-11 and all the mandates, it, it, we used to worry about intoxicated people. That's not, that's, that's far from our issue now. It's, it's, it's bigger things. Um, and one little historical thing is when I started in 1999, we had 30 police officers. Uh, we had 9,700 calls for service. We're up to 26,000 calls for service. Um, we, we, we have, and we run two full school districts with the charter school, which is K through 12. We support through the SRO program and our own schools. Um, we, we do follow-ups on all domestics. We do um, everything with um, the security plans with the state, the live venue task force, um, and, and we're connected uh, with the JTTF. That is all-encompassing um, for our time. We have nine hotels and motels now, which we never had. We have over 350 accidents a year. Traffic is increasing. Um, the police reform mandate certification, that's a whole nother administrative um, requirement from training to HR to reporting. Um, and all these use of force, national data, these weren't even being done. That these are all, we are all in full compliance. And then, um, you know, we, we also have potentially the marijuana licensing and the inspection that's going to be added onto the police department as well. So, um, and this is just, uh, eventually what we need to address is that we need a traffic officer, we need a, a, a special ops, an event planner, Homeland Security Lieutenant for Gillette Stadium, Patriot Place. We need two patrol officers to, roll, to fill out the, the bodies and a, vet, and a detective sergeant to oversee the, um, the major case um, that get investigated. So, so none, of those, none of those positions are in the current budget, is that correct? They are not, they are not. Um, this was a tight year. Um, the town manager uh, was clear about where we were financially and uh, finance. So I have so, a question for uh, got a question for Bill Keegan, mm -hmm. and that is uh, that the staffing needs that he's he's shown there that's supported by you know independent studies, kind of concurring with the with the need. Uh, how is that? Is that in the strategic plan for the town? Are discussions happening with the board of directors around this? You know, what from your perspective is the plan to uh, assess and address some of the needs that have been identified? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big problem, uh, Molly, because, you know, it, it all comes down to available dollars. And, and at the end of the day, we only have so much that we can spend in any direction. Um, but, you know, our biggest concern and, and, and what I've tried to do is look at ways we can raise additional funds and, and find ways we can self-supplement the departments, uh, in both all, all our public safety departments, because of the fact that we do have, um, we do have genuine needs. There's no question that the, the chief has highlighted a lot of those in tonight's presentation. The, what I do think, um, you know, we, we've talked about marijuana as a potential for a, a potential revenue stream that could actually uh, potentially help that situation. Um, at the same time, it also creates, you know, a question as to how much it's gonna impact the town at the same time. The other thing that uh, that strikes me in listening to what the chief said tonight is that well, all the time being spent at Gillette Stadium, I'm not sure why we're not charging Gillette Stadium for those costs. Because really they're, they're costs that are unique to the stadium, not unique to the community. So I think we should be finding a way, a way to help provide additional funding for those kind of things through the stadium as opposed to just Paying it for as, as a community. So it's supposed to be a zero impact to the town with respect to, to uh, costs that, that are being affected by the town in that respect. So it's something we should be looking at if that's in fact the case. So, and there's no question, I think that the, the time that the chief talks about being spent on, on planning for events, uh, those things are not paid for by Gillette Stadium. Those are paid for, they only pay for the time that is actually paid, paid at the stadium itself. They're not paid. Uh, while they while they're planning for these events uh, day after day during the week leading up to those events, and so that's something that really has to be explored a little bit further because um, it's not something the town should be paying for if it's, it's if it's specific to those events at Gillette Stadium. So I think those are those are questions that have to be looked at. I think the the uh, and and then it's a question of you know where what other possible revenue sources can we look to 
to try and raise funding for that. And it's not just as simple as saying, let's go to, let's go to the um, the federal government, let's go to the state, because oftentimes when you when you look at those options, the federal government will provide you a grant a lot of times, it'll be for three years, and then the, then the funding drops off, and then the town is stuck with the bill. So I think that's something where, you know, it, it is a short-term gap uh, thing. And we've actually, as you can see, the, the chief pointed out in his last slide, that we have not been ignoring the, the additional staffing. We've had nine police officers during that time frame. Uh, so it's not like we, we haven't been adding. It's just the fact that, you know, the call volume has increased steadily over that period of time. And a lot of it was, uh, I think, COVID-related, too. I mean, it's let's, let's face it, there were a lot of things uh, happening right now that have caused people to be, um, uh, I would say, you know, impatient, if you will, with, with how they, they're dealing with each other and causing a lot more domestic issues than we've seen in the past. Um, and I think that's uh, a reason why the police department is, is called upon so often in, in, in this day and age. So, but I do think uh, the chief has, has highlighted a number of things that you know, we, we clearly need to talk about further and come up with a, with a better plan to address over the longer term. Um, and I think, uh, you know, his, his, some of his points are well taken. That, uh, but again, we have, it's not that we, have, we haven't ignored it. We just haven't been able to fund it based on our existing, uh, given, given our current revenue stream. Uh, Chief, uh, I remember last year, uh, you know, eliminating civil service was a major goal. And, you know, uh, to your credit, you really were able to, to get it done. And we're in a very different place. Have you felt any positive impact yet with the uh, with a civil service gone in terms of filling positions? I recall you had four open positions last year you couldn't fill, and uh, now without civil service in terms of filling positions and getting better qualified people, are you starting to see any impact? I can tell you, Dennis. Um, since we left, I, I did fill one position almost immediately, um, which was a um, it was a. Um, a full-time academy trained police officer who had actually grown up in town and was able to uh, jump on board right away. He had worked at a college. He had his college degree and been working at a municipality for seven years. Um, he's, he's a dad with four kids, his mom and dad. Still, and I was able to grab him and, and I was able to do a background check in three weeks because he had worked for us for like five years. And he's the nicest young man. So the, and I can tell you, um, what Foxborough has been able to do um, as a community um, from top to bottom and where we stand, I get, um, and that, that wouldn't be the hiring process. People send me resumes, but everybody's asking if we're taking bodies. Obviously, we're going to follow our policies, our hiring policies, and get our tests going and get an active list. Uh, but, in a, but now, if I in a situation where all of a sudden something happens and I lose two or three bodies, I can get them court now. I'm not. I'm not tied. My hands aren't tied anymore. It's really been beneficial. That's great. I, I have a question. Um, I yes. guess for um, Bill uh, Key and, and and maybe the chief or the chief can just listen. I'm not even sure if it's uh, if it's something we can take care of now. But I'm I, again. I'm new and I'm a novice, and I I look at the budget every week in each department. And you, I guess you have asked each department not to increase their budget by two point five percent. Is there a way? I mean, it seems as though, I mean, this is kind of an emergency or important, very, very important situation the police department's in. Is there a way that I'm not sure now, but in the future that you might ask a department to say, you know what, increase it by 2% or 1.5, and we could give that extra to a department. I, I don't know if this is something towns do. Again, I, I, you know, this is all new to me, but we could give the police department a 3% increase, a 4% increase. I mean, I, I'm just... You know, thinking about these other streams of revenue, and they may take a while, they may not happen. So, what can towns do internally? I don't even know if that's to be answered here, and that's okay if it isn't. But yeah. um, this presentation no. is, seems pretty serious uh, in some of the issues. And uh, I think if if more of the townspeople saw a presentation like this instead of just going to town meeting and look at the papers, you know, very quickly in an hour or two or three. Uh, you know, they would understand the, the, this, I think, the seriousness of it. So I don't know if that right, could so, be. So, so just let me just address the, a few of those, those things. So, so yeah. um, my direction to departments was that we want to come in with a 2.5% budget, which, by the way, we haven't even met yet. We, we are coming in closer right. to about 27 to 3%. And, um, and I think that 
I didn't say to any one specific department that you had to meet that department. Well, I said, okay. I'm looking to try and get to that point. So you actually you saw some, several that came in under 2%, under 2.5%, as, as did the police department in this particular instance as well. So, and there are others that did as well. So there were very few instances where people exceeded that, but in the, if they did, it was for a very good reason and, and one that you, and reasons that you've also, and more often than, than not have agreed with as well. So it's not like we're, we're, we're saying it's an absolute, but I, I, what I did was a goal that we set for everyone. And, um, and this was a year, and, and if you take a look, if you go back in time, over the past, you know, this is my ninth, I think my ninth budget that, I, that I've worked on since I've been here, that we've averaged closer to three to four uh, percent in terms of growth of the budget year year over year. Um, some cases, it's actually gone a little bit higher than that. And that's because our revenues were able to support that. But um, in this, this particular year, we're coming out of a, a, a couple, two years back to back where our revenues were limited. Uh, we want to take a very careful uh, and measured approach going into the budget for next year. That that being said, I don't expect that to be the case on the other side. Now, there are a couple budget pressures that we need to be mindful of. One is the cost of oil. And, and if you can see in, in, in what's going on in the world today, um, they're now saying that gas could be, you know, five, six dollars a gallon, which could really impact the budget um, in ways which we did none of us had anticipated. Um, the other thing is the fact that the cost of heating oil and all in the build buildings or any of the kind of the fuel, the cost of natural gas, those are all being impacted as well, given the current geo, geopolitical situation. So we have to be mindful of that those are budget pressures that are going to come that that really haven't been factored into um, in the long term. But you know we we could find ways to, to make that happen if we had to. But again, we draw upon our, I keep drawing on our reserves when we do that. And I really don't like to see us do that, given the circumstances. So I think. What was we were trying to do this year was to come in with a very measured approach to try and come up with a with a uh, budget that fit within our budget revenues this year without drawing too much on our, rev our on our reserve situation, so we could go into next into the following year in a, in a pretty healthy situation. Um, the chiefs the chief has done a really good job of highlighting his needs. I think uh, there are needs that have been uh, identified in virtually all the departments that we could do that we could use more with. Um, clearly, public safety is on the high, is high on our list of trying to support um, both fire, police, and um, and um, any one of our public safety actions. We want to make sure that we're, we're protecting the community as best we can. But having said that, it's uh, there's, there's multiple pressures on that department because um, because it's hard to find police officers. Number one, I mean, getting out of civil service was huge for us uh, because it does provide us more flexibility that we could have be, uh, that we didn't have before. Um, and I think that we're going to be better off going forward because we'll be able to, again, have, have a better flexibility hiring local officers who are familiar with the community. Uh, I think the police, the fire chief can actually talk to you about that because he's had the history of doing that in Foxman has worked out really, really well for us. So now the police department will have that same, same ability to do that. So in, the, in short, yes, we're very, we're very cognizant of that. We're very, we're also very mindful of the fact that we, we're put in a very difficult spot to try and make it all fit together. And, um, and I do think that uh, to the extent that, you know, we are aware of, of, the, of the, the approach that the chief is using to try and to keep his operation running. But I also think at the same time, um, we have to be um, a, a continue to be measured in our approach so we don't overspend in any one direction at any one time. Um, it could be times when, when, it, when it sometimes are worse than others. But I think we want to be uh, continue to do something where we can support the budget with with a proper rate of growth going forward that we can afford. Chief Grace, real quick, do you have a um, a metric to compare to other towns? You know, like uh, schools have uh, students per teacher. Do you have you know officers per calls and how they compare with Mansfield, Walpole, local communities? Any any easy quick ways to see it, mm -hmm. if Foxborough is really behind or above the surrounding groups? Yeah, there's all there's all national statistics about population, but unfortunately, when you look at Foxborough, we're not normal. We have an NFL stadium, so there isn't a community in Massachusetts that um, has the demands that are a business that puts these kind of demands on. And then actually, in the NFL, there's only three stadiums that aren't, aren't in a major city, so um, it's. That part of the, uh, it, it's like, it's it's like, I mean, ultimately when we're talking about, we're going to build that out as another town on a CAD system. 
and start collecting that data. When I talk about the 26,000 calls for service, that doesn't include Gillette. That could, we have another way of calculating all of those calls for service. But, you know, the, I think there's like a, there's a formula that the federal government uses. I think it's what uh, 1.5 maybe per population. But it really starts breaking down of what are your calls for service, what, what kind of crimes that you're seeing. And on top of that, what are you doing proactively to be in your community? And how are you addressing growth in your community? How are you addressing the needs of residents? Uh, for example, you could have a certain population and it says you'd have seven cops. But as the town grows and neighbors are asking for traffic studies or my road, people are speeding, it's critical that the police department is able to address those all the time and work with your town planners. So, and, and as, as things build out, as we approve, you know, we have nine hotels in Foxborough, you don't even want to see what kind of calls come out of those. Okay. And we have all cast the characters. If you don't have nine hotels and you take the same size and compare it to Norfolk, but has no hotels, I can tell you 11, between 11 at night and 2 a.m. in the morning, is it's it's a different animal. So I don't know if I, John, if I really answered your question, um, but we're very unique. We, we don't really, we are like a standalone um, police department. No, thank you, I appreciate that. But I'm, I mean, I'd be, I wouldn't want to see us way behind other communities either. And obviously with the extra, you know, with the extra stadium needs, but if, if Walpole had, an extra 10 officers than you, I'd, I'd, I'd be quite surprised. Um, I can't get that right this second and maybe give me five minutes. I might be able to send a text message, but I, it, it's, it's, um, it, and it's always not the number. The number is, it's where you're applying the number and how you're addressing the, the, the needs and the calls and, and the crime trends and being proactive and with your schools. You know, some departments pull their SROs out of their schools as soon as they have, don't have enough people. I can tell you the kids in this community, I grew up in town, I well, I had three kids in the school system. I'm never doing that. The schools are everything to me and that's where I'm gonna start with. So if we gotta force someone on an overtime shift, it is what it is, but the SRO is going to, to the high school at eight o'clock in the morning to help the kids. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Mike, you. you're up. Uh, your first uh, uh, slide. A highlighter, among other things, distracted driving. Yes. Uh, we are, uh, we'll be talking in the not too distant future about more electronic signs in town. Tell me, or tell us something about the statistics. Is, are the electronic signs a significant distraction that therefore cause accidents? Well, um, well, we're getting into a variety of different conversations here, Jack, but I will tell you, if you notice, they did a study uh, because one of our residents in Foxborough, you guys know the story, it's so sad, but he was the one who initiated the bill because he was talking to his son who was on the cell phone who passed away in the accident, uh, Jerry Sibley, and Dave Sergeant Fiscal, though, had to make notification, ran to him and drove him to um, Sturdy Hospital. So Jerry pushed for that bill for the hands-free. And when they came out with the statistics, we were one of the uh, one of the communities that had stopped the most amount of vehicles for hands-free violations. Now they weren't money citations, but they were we were addressing people. What you'll see with cars and technology is eventually technology is going to force the cell phone out of people's hands. As people buy newer cars, the car is going to acclimate. And number one is the older generation uh, will be less talking like to the slice of pizza and they will be acclimating. And you'll see the hands free come down a little bit. And I think you'll see people, but um, the billboard signs, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I can't answer that. You drive down Saugus and you see them everywhere. They're like, you know, it's, um, but out on the highway, are people going to look up and see him? I, yeah, I mean, someone did their homework, who went to school for marketing and says they work. Uh, uh, nice family picture in the reporter, by the way. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> which one was it? <laughs> uh, uh, your son with the hockey. Uh... Oh, well, we're missing one. My other son's out in Fort Carson. So, um, thank you. 
And my daughter's upset. She didn't know she was going to get dragged into it. Didn't wear the right shoes. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, further questions, Bill? Go ahead. Yeah, just one, one last one last thought here, and it's one that I'm sure I'll be criticized later on for saying this, but but I wanted to say that you know several references have been made to the fact that we're an NFL community, but which which raises the, the specter and concern that I that I raised before is the fact that. Are we getting the right, right level of revenue from the from the stadium revenues that we should be getting in order to support the, the community overall? And the answer is no, we're not. Um, we, if you take a look at the growth of revenues that have occurred at, at Gillette itself, itself in the past 20 years, they we are a fraction of what they what they've made into the way the current uh, the, 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 the lease is structured. As such, it doesn't generate the revenue. To support our organization, you know, the references that chief, the chief, all chiefs that can make here tonight, both Mike Kelleher as well as Chief, uh, as Chief Grace can, can attest to, is the amount of time that they put into into planning for events and things of that nature, which are never never uh, provided to as revenue for the community in that respect, are not are not supported in that way. Right? They are not directly supported by the stadium events. So, so I think that's something that we have to re reassess. And, and have to take a look at it as a community because you know we're trying very hard to to, to be you know a very forthright and, and and professional community in all levels but we're not receiving the level of of support that we're getting through the revenue sources that we're, we're getting from from that particular venue so it is an important issue and i i think that we shouldn't lose sight of that because um a lot of times being spent up there a lot of times being and we do what we want we have a great relationship with those guys we want to continue that but we still need to need to have a better source of revenue other than than the, than the kind of revenue source we have. Yep, uh, I duly noted, and I, I don't think you would be criticized for that. In fact, I believe I've had a couple conversations with Jack on that very subject mm -hmm. over the last two or three years. So uh, I don't I don't believe you're alone in in that regard. So, um, barring any. Further questions? I'm going to move on to uh, the fire department budget and Chief Kelleher. Uh, thanks, Chief Grace. And, Thank you. Uh, and if, if anybody has a question or anything, the door is always open. Swing down, call me, email. I'm always available. I'm, hey, Mike. How's it going? Right. <laughs> I, I just want to make one point that I got stuck with the last slot because Roger Hatfield always went over his time. I think next year the, the ADCOM needs to reevaluate the the, uh, the structure here. <laughs> All right. We'll slide you in first next year. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> it was wrong <laughs> slot. I haven't left the office yet, okay? <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Um, so I'll try to be, I'll try to be brief. Um, i just do a quick... Um, Kind of recap of the the year. Let me just. How's that? Everyone can see that. Yep. Good to go. Okay. All right. So real quick, um, kind of a just a quick in year in review. Um, last year again was dominated by COVID vaccines, COVID and uh, COVID testing. All things COVID. We're still we're, we're just coming out of it now. So we uh, again we were well positioned with our move with public health nurse uh, to to be. You know, ahead of the curve as far as all of the uh, the you know the, the COVID um, response, um, we pivoted really from testing to vaccinations. Again, we were leaders uh, here in southeastern Massachusetts. We were the distribution site because we had the public health nurse. We had a uh, state-sanctioned vaccine program, so we provided vaccines to about nine communities down here. So we were kind of the focal point as far as vaccine distribution. After we uh, really started to come out of the the, the COVID. Um, you know, last spring, our, our run volume skyrocketed. We kind of saw a, a flat start to, um, you know, 2020 as, as the, you know, the, the virus took hold. And then really we saw a real surge. Um, we're starting to really see the full impact of Nova Hospital being close to it's It's really affected our operation. Um, you know, there's obviously you know, things we need to do to, to be able to respond to our calls. But, you know, the, those, those uh, measures that we take to respond to these calls, do come with inherent risk to the community. So, uh, you know, that is, that is noted. I know there's been some discussion about the, the impact. You know, ambulance calls take longer, both in transport time. And then with some of the stuff going on in healthcare today, 
um, there's longer wait times to offload that patient too. So it's a double impact. It's not just the distance to the hospital, it's also wait times because the 60 or 70,000 visits a year that Norwood Hospital saw, those patients are going other places. So it's not, it's not just, you know, the, it's a volume issue, especially when it comes to a community hospital like Sturdy, where you saw the closure of Pawtucket Memorial Hospital in Pawtucket just over the line, because it is a border city in Attleboro. Um, you know, those patients are coming over the border to go to, to Attleboro, and then you have the closure of Norwood Hospital, and you're feeling that pressure south from, from basically Foxboro South uh, you're, you're seeing real, real high volume and high wait times. So when we show up in the ambulance, sometimes we're held in the ambulance bay and our, our paramedics are sitting in the back of the ambulance, sometimes for up to a half hour, 45 minutes, waiting for a bed that the, we can wheel the patient in and offload. So it's not just uh, we're, we're transporting to further places like Boston, Brockton, Taunton, Newton, Wellesley, um, but, but then we're also experiencing a long wait time. So just want to just kind of highlight that point. And obviously, Gillette's really busy um, this year. We're looking at a, a very busy year with concerts. Uh, we've had some meetings again today, just reviewing uh, some some concert uh, layouts and stage layout seating charts for the, uh, the floors and the various acts that are coming in. And then obviously, construction's busy too. So your fire department, we're both an emergency response agency and also a regulatory enforcement agency. So we have those responsibilities uh, during construction and remodeling where we look at fire protection features and sprinkler systems, egress, um, and then you know fire alarm systems, things like that. So we, we, we do um, review and approve various safety systems. A lot of these buildings, like the $250 million renovation at Gillette, you know, we have to review all of those safety systems to make sure they're uh, compliant up to code. We work with the town manager that uh, the, the board of selectmen sets goals for the town manager and you know we support those goals as uh, working under the town manager and as department heads. Um, so, so some of the goals, I, I just wanted to highlight some of the goals that we have um, well, that the town manager has that we support. And one of those is, is creating new business models or finding uh, alternative revenue sources. So obviously, you know, through insurance uh, premiums and through insurance billing, we, we have, uh, Ambulance revenue, um, you know, we're very diligent in, in our uh, paperwork and ambulance building processes. So, you know, that revenue comes back to the community um, through um, vaccines and COVID testing. Um, we created a public health revolving account so we can have a, a fund that, that's uh, basically, you know, self-fulfilling. So when we're uh, providing vaccines and things like that uh, throughout the community, that money comes back. So next year we can buy more vaccines. So we gave out a number of flu vaccines, COVID vaccines, things like that. And a lot of that's reimbursable through either uh, Medicare or private insurance companies. Um, one of the things I'm not sure everyone's aware, but we, we repair apparatus, uh, fire apparatus, uh, for Norfolk, Franklin, and Rentham. Um, you know, prior to the pandemic, we, you know, there were, were workforce issues, especially with trades like mechanics, uh, fire apparatus mechanics, or like unicorns, they really just don't exist. So to, to be able to um, have a certified and qualified fire apparatus mechanic is really in demand. So anytime you go by any of the fire apparatus manufacturers in the area, there's one up on Route 1, you can see um, trucks from all over New England just sitting there waiting to be fixed. Um, so there's really a backlog for every 10 mechanics that retire, four take their place. So there's a shortage of, of qualified mechanics in general in the automotive industry. So um, what we're seeing is a, a, is a willingness and, and really it wasn't a, it was an idea I had. It was a request from a neighboring chief. Uh, he had a, a truck breakdown. It was an emergency. It had another truck out of service. He approached me and said, hey, can you just send your mechanic over to take a look? He went over and fixed it really out of goodwill. You know, at that point, we didn't have an intermunicipal agreement. And one of the things that the chief requested is, hey, can you, can you fix our fire trucks? So, um, you know, that program's kind of blossomed and, and caught on. So that's another thing. Um, if you go by the public safety building over the last six months, uh, we have our cell tower. Uh, at and coming on the cell tower. We already have Verizon. That's additional revenue into the general fund for uh, the community. I think it's about $3,500 a month. Bill, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we're very diligent FEMA reimbursements. We started off the pandemic. We were the central collection point for uh, all of FEMA reimbursements for the town for the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, Assistant Chief Buckley was really the, the tip of the spear as far as that went. Uh, exorbitant amount of work. We were able to get a consultant on board to help us with that, but um, all of that went through the fire department initially. It was pretty busy. And then um, we, we transitioned that over to the finance team with um, the consultant. 
And uh, we also had a public-private partnership with Transformative Healthcare. We helped staff the uh, vaccine site you know, during the, uh, the vaccine rollout. So we not only did we uh, serve as the focal point, but because we had the depth and staff, you know, from staffing major events at Gillette Stadium, we were able to pull in those resources from our surrounding communities to help staff because they couldn't get enough healthcare workers to staff that site. So a uh, really good private partnership. Um, the, the, the revenue loss that the town saw from billing details from the fire department side uh, during the, the COVID-19 pandemic was made up because Transformative Healthcare paid all of our individuals uh, their detail pay and the surrounding communities and uh, the town get the 10% uh, administrative fee. So we built out about a million dollars in details for, for the for the surrounding communities in Foxborough. So the town made about a hundred thousand dollars in that in that revenue fee, which which helped offset that loss in that year. So uh, this is just some of the um, collaboration that goes on during the during during the year throughout the community. Obviously we're very uh, linked tightly with the Board of Health. Uh, Deputy Chief Kenman is the town's public health nurse as well. So we collaborate with them as a lot, probably uh, the most out of any any department, we're heavily engaged with the uh, inspections department and the uh, building commissioner. So, you know, that's we'll make sure that we have uh, staff. We, we meet weekly, so everyone's in the loop. Uh, these are just some other uh, goals that we help support. You know, we're always looking for ways to become more efficient. And, you know, basically sharper. Um, we're also in the process of becoming accredited. Uh, this should happen within the next six to eight months, hopefully, maybe a little longer. Again, COVID kind of delayed this. Uh, co uh, uh, being accredited in Massachusetts, there's no fire departments that are accredited. Um, there's two in New England. Nationally, it's, it's, it's caught on, but up here in the Northeast, we're, we're in, especially public safety-wise, we're usually slow to, uh, slow to come to the table. So, um, about 12% of the U.S. population is protected by accredited agencies, but um, we're hoping that Foxborough will be one of them in the next, you know, the coming months. This just gives you a three-year comparison on, uh, like, our fire inspections and plan review, things like that. So, we, again, this is getting into the more regulatory enforcement side. So, you can see we've had a pretty significant increase in inspections over the last three years, even with COVID. Uh, one of the things we need to do during the pandemic was pivot and help restaurants come up with alternative ways to serve food. So, you know, things like outdoor dining, obviously there were the things like tents, stuff like that. So we, uh, we saw an 18% increase in, in inspections from 2020 to 2021 in the 14 over a two year period. So we have some major projects going on. Again, those major projects require a lot more effort and um, review. These are some of the uh, things that we do as far as public health and emergency medical services. We do you know, work with the community doing DP, DP clinics. We uh, provide COVID testing um, to, to different uh, entities, different town departments. We supported all the town departments with COVID testing, keeping people at work. So we were able to get a, uh, a bench top um, PCR testing machine, which allowed us to do instant tests with the, you know, we had the top tier results, you know, the gold standard for COVID testing. So we were able to do that and support our local department. So if a DPW worker came in, didn't feel good, he was able to come to the fire department we were able to test them and make sure that uh, he did not have COVID and then was able to return to work or conversely had COVID and we sent them, uh, you know, sent them home for the quarantine period. So uh, we gave out 1,200 uh, vaccines, Moderna vaccines, about 317 uh, flu vaccines last fall. So some of the needs and gaps, obviously, uh, staffing, especially with the issues going on right now with our emergency medical services, we'll have to have a dedicated second ambulance for the town. Right now we run he did his two firefighter paramedics assigned to the ambulance all the time. They don't come off. If there's a fire and they're available, they respond to the fire and the ambulance. That way, if, if you know, the fire gets under control or it's a, you know, it's a small fire or a false alarm, they're able to respond to the next call. Um, so we, we, like I mentioned before, we're seeing uh, increased hospital wait times, emergency room wait times. You know, there's a lot of, lot of volume. Uh, there's also a crisis in the ambulance industry where a lot of the private ambulances aren't available. Um, you know, their their staff units are way down. So, you know, that, that helps, that, that doesn't help. So the, the hospital system is clogged up. So people that need to be transferred from a community hospital to a, a, you know, a major Boston hospital, you know, might be waiting 48 to 72 hours where they might have an ambulance in three hours before. So, and then obviously, you know, we we'll always talk about the, uh, the need for a, a 
uh, substation. You know, that's that's something the town needs to plan for in the future. I think it's going to be an important uh, piece of public safety in the future. You know, having a secondary uh, area where we can deploy fire rescue and EMS apparatus. You know, improve improve response times, especially as the town grows. So currently, right now, this is our current deployment model. You have eight uh, eight firefighters assigned to a shift. They work on four working groups. Um, 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, it's consistent, consists of a captain, a lieutenant, and six firefighters. Uh, the average about 11 calls a day. Today, uh, you know, as of a, an hour or two ago, they did about 15 calls. So one time we had six calls going on at once. We won, uh, we won one dedicated ambulance. We won one dedicated piece of fire apparatus. And then... Um, the other four people float between fire and ambulance, depending on what the call is. So it's a bit of a the Chinese fire drill, if you will. So just wanted to highlight. So we have one ambulance call, and that ambulance goes to Boston, like it did this morning. Then we have a subsequent ambulance call. So that now takes out because of the cross staffing uh, that takes up a piece of fire apparatus and a piece of EMS equipment out of out of service. And then uh, one of the things that became necessary. After you know what hospital closed, is staffing a third ambulance because we're getting that third medical call. And, you know, it's, it's we have to go with the call we have as opposed to the potential call. So we might have a fire, we might have a car accident, you know, we might have whatever. But I, if, a, if a medical call comes in, we need to, to send that piece of apparatus. So we're sending the third. So that leaves uh, one truck with two people covering the community. And that was what we had for a majority of the day. So if, if, if a building fire comes in, uh, or a car accident or anything else you're getting, you, you, we're, we're pretty, we're stretched pretty thin, especially when it comes to, you know, the distances these people are traveling to, to take people to the hospital. So <laughs> I want to highlight that, um, you know, that, so the, the, the measures we took to, to kind of, you know, minimize the impact of Norwood hospital closing, it, it is putting the community at, at a bit of risk. There is risk that comes with that. So we don't have a complement of firefighters available should a building fire come in. Um, so the budget allows for us to, to fill to eight firefighters, um, with all scheduled leave. So if they're on personal leave or vacation time, they're, 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 they are funded for backfilling those positions. But, um, if somebody takes bereavement or sick, we don't cover it. So the night we had the fire on central street, we we're actually short one firefighter, which took, uh, the second new engine. Off, off the road, so we didn't have a, a truck for the fire hydrant. The guys had to manually stretch a line to the fire hydrant instead of the, the second engine being able to lay that in and feed that. So, you know, it does it does affect operations occasionally. You know, when we do, uh, fortunately, you know, we have pretty good attendance record, and and you know, with the, with the funding, we're we're funded most of the time for eight people. So, so you have uh, you have eight people as as a team. Uh, is there a national standard, and what does the national standard call for? Yeah, the national standard would be uh, NFPA 1710. They call for um, fire apparatus to be staffed with four people, um, and, and they have you know they have time elements. They want a full full what's called a full first alarm assignment at any uh, building fire within uh, eight minutes. So that would be twelve to fifteen firefighters. Um, Within within eight minutes at a at a, at a uh, building fire and they 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 actually have a, a standard which would be a standard eighteen hundred square foot uh, cape with no basement. That's the so that that would be the deployment model and that's the standard. But you know obviously we we don't come close to to meeting that with the uh, you know with the volume of the ambulance calls we're doing you know in the double duty. So it is a, it is a challenge so we, we do rely on mutual aid but obviously mutual aid that eight minutes is is uh you know that's not gonna that's not we're not gonna hit that mark we want to just draw a comparison to the uh SEMRAC communities again we all agreed uh, when we went through the process with SEMRAC that the communities were very similar we happen to have the smallest population but if you look we actually have um the second highest run volume we have the lowest amount of staffing. We we only have you know we're covering the most amount of territory because if you look, other people have multiple stations, so we're covering the full twenty square miles from one location. We have a town like Easton; they have three stations, which they're covering nine mile, nine point seven miles per station. So, you know we you know we're the lowest budget. Um, so we're really I, I truly believe we're operating as well efficiently as we can, yeah. and there's really not much room for increasing call volume without increasing staffing. 
Yeah. So. so, so Chief, um, as you said, you know, Norwood Hospital was one of the busiest uh, EAS in the whole state, and that's offline. And Sturdy can't handle that flight. How, how much, and what, what's really relevant to Foxborough is how much is that ambulance re, uh, response time degraded? Because minutes save lives when it comes to somebody has a heart attack. And whether the ambulance gets there in four minutes or 10 minutes, that, that can be life or death. Uh, the other thing is how, how much have you expanded, uh, you, you know, what uh, paramedics can do in the field? Yeah, so um, so to answer the first part of your question, yes, like today we had to have um, Mansfield, and I believe Sharon came in to help us out. Um, at one point, all of our units were, were completely tied up, uh, answering multiple calls, and then we had to have, you know, help come in from other communities. But so that, you know, right there is a delay when you're waiting for, for Mansfield or Sharon to come in uh, to help us out. Um, and also the transport distance, you know, that obviously... There's a, there's a, so the other problem is there's a lot of consideration so that the, the the officers that are on the shifts making the decisions as to where people go and what, you know, the, the point of entry. So, uh, you know, there's certain hospitals that are stroke centers, there's certain hospitals that are burn centers, there's certain hospitals that have, you know, cardiac catheterization 24-7 as opposed to on call. So the, it, there's a lot of things that are on the paramedics mind in terms of where people are going time of day, obviously trying to get to Mass General at four o'clock in the afternoon is damn near impossible. Um, so we've got to really consider closer hospitals like Good Samaritan. Good Samaritan's high volume, very busy, you know, urban ER. So they see, you know, they see a ton of patients there. Um, so, so going there, there, you know, it's a very busy place. And, you know, depending on the acuity, if, if we go there in, in the, uh, the time of day, and, and again, their volume might not be the, the best for our patients either. So we really have to be considerate as to where we're taking people and, and again, time of day, um, you know, the, the, the services available. Good Samaritan is a level two trauma center, a level three trauma center. So it, it's good for, for, for trauma, you know, so that they, they have services available there. Um, you know, Sturdy does not. Um, you know, a lot of the Boston hospitals have the, the, the uh, level one trauma designation. We go there, Rhode Island Hospital is another option. Miriam Hospital in Providence has a pretty good cardiac catheterization lab. So those are all considerations you have to take, but it's, again, there's a lot of things where, you know, um, a lot of those decisions would have to be made if no one was here. My two separate questions. Um, the first one, uh, mutual aid with the ambulances. Uh, a few years ago, it was quite imbalanced with Mansfield, but they added staff and, and fixed that. Uh, is it approximately equal now? And the second question, um, is I recall that you've got a secondhand ambulance because the one that was on order is not yet ready. Um, so you do have an ambulance in the works. Do I, is that correct? We have, uh, we've ordered two ambulances. Yes, we have two ambulances that are on order. Uh, we ordered them last July. We still don't have VIN numbers for those chassis. So um, yeah, I did, I did uh, at the last minute, we had some money left in our budget and um, we combined that with some, um, some money that we had in our apparatus revolving account and we were able to buy an, an ambulance that was a brand new chassis that had a box remounted on it and that's that's what we're using now it's a small little ambulance you see running around town um, just because of the mileage we had a pretty significant mileage on our on our ambulance we you know in cases we were putting on five times the mileage that we would have normally on these vehicles so um that's that was one of the measures we had to take but we have two ambulances on order and uh, we have no idea when we're going to be able to get them. So financially, we have done what we can to support the ambulance. It's not, it's not that we haven't uh, budgeted it. Uh, it's uh, simply that we haven't been able to uh, get them from the uh, manufacturer. As far as the ambulances themselves, the vehicles, yes, that, that, that is a correct statement. Yeah, you've, 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 it's, the town has certainly invested in the ambulance and, um, you know, and certainly... You know, that is there's a, a well supported program. Just the, the staffing is what it concerns me as far as not having people available to go on emergency calls. So, uh, did you say that we are approximately on balance with respect to the mutual aid? 
Yeah, so this this communities around us that uh, that are experiencing um, shortages. It's uh, one community, Brentham's uh, civil service. Uh, they're having difficulty hiring paramedics. They're they're a little short staffed right now. So we're, you know, that's that's a little imbalance. We're running over there quite a bit. Um, but I, that's something that I have a sense that will will uh, level off in the future, in your future. So you know, it ebbs and flows. There, you know, so communities have different. Uh, you know, different pressures, different stresses, so you know, different different things going on. But that's just one example. But those uh, those problems always seem to be self solving. Uh, Chief, when is um when is Norwood Hospital due to be back and online? What year? That is a, that is a great question. Um, we got plenty of billboards up and down Route One saying they're coming back, but when when is that going to happen? We haven't seen much uh, in terms of of um we haven't seen much in terms of what you know construction things like that I, I i haven't heard of a lot there's a um there's a meeting tomorrow that uh steward's doing with the fire chiefs to, to have a conversation about it but you know we have these meetings and then i don't I, you know you really don't see a lot of action uh, i know i know there's been rumors that uh, they've, they've said that they're not bringing back the psych beds or uh ob so they won't have uh ob care there so which is a shame i was born there my yeah. daughter was born there, so I was born there. Yeah. <laughs> There's also rumors that the steward is uh trying to shop shop themselves and be acquired. Well, so. you know, it is they are a for-profit entity. There's a they're a for profit corporation. So they, they you know, they're obviously gonna do you know what they need to do to to help their bottom line. They 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 have some really like if you look at them nationally or inter, they're an international company, but if you look at them nationally. They have some unique models down in Texas. They have standalone emergency rooms and you know other unique uh, things as an accountable healthcare organization. So they they're always trying different different uh, delivery methods of healthcare. I'm not sure that those methods would um, be effective up here because of the you know the proximity to Boston and and having some of the you know the finest medical facilities in the world right right at our fingertips. I, you know, understandably, like you know, Texas, other places have more remote areas, so. It'll be interesting to see. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'd be very curious to see if, if Norwood comes back, you know, as it was, you know, as we all knew it five years ago. So I, I, I have a sense that it's not, but that's just my own intuition. I don't, I have no evidence to support that. So, Dan, to, to uh, support your question uh, relative to uh, the when that hospital is going to open, that's, this is the third time I've had this conversation today about that one facility. We, we talked about it at operations this morning, and we talked about it at this with the seniors this afternoon, and now we're having it again tonight. So it's very relevant and it's something that we're very watching very, very closely. Apparently, the, the governor was out to uh, participate in a, uh, a groundbreaking ceremony recently, but uh, the backstory on that is that the, 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 it's, it's unclear as to how, how far along they really are in that process of getting the developer. You're talking years down the road. I mean, it's it's a couple of years before they get before they demo it and then they rebuild it and then fully fully get it operational. You're you're at least a couple of years out before you see it operational again. Yeah, and there's a, there's a lot of processes. Um, it's not like just it's not like just throwing a building up. Um, you know, it's heavily regulated by the Department of Public Health. Everything has to be approved and you know reviewed and inspected. So there's a whole. The only thing regulated more than hospitals is uh, nuclear power plants. So I you know being as bureaucratic as that process is going to be, I, I would have to imagine that it's going to, it's going to be quite a few years. You know. Yep, absolutely. Uh, is that the end of your slide, so Chief? Um, yeah, that's yep. it. It's, it's a pretty, uh, like, it's pretty lean year. Uh, looking for about 70,000 total. It's about a 1.8% increase in the budget. Um, 40 of that, 40,000 of that would be seed money for the mechanics to do uh, apparatus work. So they can uh, continue the the apparatus um, program. Um, Ten thousand of that was the addition of the Juneteenth holiday, um, and then the, the the remainder was some contractual uh, items and just some modest increases and some other other uh, overtime lines. So um, nothing, there's nothing really major there. So it's like I said, it's about a one percent one point eight percent increase. I think overall about seventy k. Okay. All right, awesome. Um, barring any further questions, I'm gonna ask the chief to um, just run through real quick, uh, especially for those who this is their first year or first annual town meeting, uh, the fire stabilization warrant article. 
if you could just run through that real quick, describe it for the new members and, and how that applies to this year, that would be great. Sure. So, and then Bill can, can correct me with any technicalities, but uh, basically um, we had a, a really good idea in um, using the um, revenue coming in for fixing apparatus to go into the apparatus revolving account, which was established to help us maintain vehicles. We built, you know, the, it's mostly from Gillette Stadium, but any vehicles used on a detail, that money would come in and then go out back out to replace those vehicles or, um, or pay for repairs. So we decided to merge those two accounts with the blessing of the selectmen and, and um, it's, it seemed to be okay. And then the auditors came in and said, you can't do that. So um, one, that's uh, their suggestion to fix the, the, the issue was to create a uh, fire overlay account where that, that money would go in, we would purchase parts and, and things of that nature um, year to year and, and, and that would be legal. Awesome. Um, we plan on doing anything with it this year in terms of purchases or uh, amounts or anything like that? No, no, just um, again, it's just, it was one of those things. I think it was more of a, just a kind of an, a, a, like the one, the one auditor said it was, this really isn't technically the way this is supposed to work. So, you know, the, the correct way to do this would be, be to have an overlay account. So I think once it's established, we'll be able to, to use it year over year just to support the program. So we're not, it doesn't impact the, the, the budgets. It's, just, it's kind of a separate thing. So it's, it's, it's really it's really an accounting correction is what it is, Dan, because the, the, the current, uh, the way we were doing it is not uh, consistent with, with, the, uh, with, the, with the rules of accounting. So we have, to, we have to make an adjustment and create the new accounting process, which, which will make it entirely uh, kosher with the, uh, with the auditors. There's a there's a minor um, uh, correction here. It's, it's not an overlay account. It's a stabilization right. account. Stabilization account, right? Yeah. Sure. yeah. Okay. Awesome. That's great. Uh, any further questions for the chief? Uh, I have right. just a question and, and a comment. And again, it's directed to to Bill Keegan, and it's around. You know, we're hearing about some of these uh, staffing needs from the fire department as well as the, the police chief. And I'm just wondering if Foxborough, the, your office and the Board of Selectsmen, is, is there a larger uh, process or strategic planning process that looks out multiple years and says, yes, we have these needs and this is where we're targeting to, to address it, as opposed to just each annual, annual year comes along and we say, well, how much can we afford and put some constraints uh, on the various departments and that's a limit is someone looking at the larger picture and a plan to address the larger need so i i think uh it's, it's a very fair question and i think uh if you take a look and, and i think the, the both chiefs will tell you that we have made significant steps for addressing the, their staffing needs over the past several years in fact uh, both uh, the fire department and the police department have grown staff wise over the past uh, five years, Chief uh, Kelleher, I think it was the past five years, we've added uh, at least four or five, four or five firefighters uh, to the department. Um, and so we're trying to do it in a way that makes sense, both financially as well as strategically. So you're absolutely right that we're not, and then, and then of course we have to, and then the step again, we're dealing with a situation where you can see where the numbers are starting to creep up in terms of responses and the, and the amount of efforts that are going out, which has sort of just impacted us in recent years, not, not so much in the, in the earlier years. So I think that's something we're going to have to adjust to and maybe look at way, ways that we can, can further support both police and fire because um, that world is evolving fairly quickly. And it's one that's uh, it's concerning to me because as it, on its face value, it's tough for us to support those efforts given the, the level of revenue that we have, but you can see what, what the police chief and, and what the fire chief and the police chief are doing is, is uh, more so probably in the fire department, they're doing more entrepreneurial types of efforts to try and bring more revenues in that can help offset that. And so we're able to do more perhaps with the fire department than they are with the police because we're able to use those ambulance funds to help support their, their, uh, their equipment as well as their, their staffing. So we, we actually supplement the budget with, with funds that come from those efforts. And then also the same thing is, is gonna hold true with the, with the repairs to the vehicles that, that the chief has undertaken in recent years, in the past year. 
which is again another way to help support the budget. So, you know, we're again constantly looking at ways in which we can be creative and and uh, and do things that make sense. Um, you know, again, the two things that, that we we're looking for in, into in terms of articles this year is you know uh, billboards, which is a revenue generator for the town, as well as you know, marijuana. So I think those are new ways that we should. But but in terms of the specific operations, both fire and police are trying to do what they can to, to raise money to help support their budget. But outside of the taxing uh, capacity of the town, because the tax itself will not support either one of these operations in, uh, in and of itself. All right, thanks. Okay, all right. Thank you, Bill. Um, with that, I'm gonna to move to the next uh, line item, which is the town clerk. Thank you, Chief Kelleher, we appreciate it. My pleasure, thank you. Thank you all for your service too. Appreciate the time you guys put into this. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. <clears throat> Mr. Cutler. Yes, sir. How are you? I am phenomenal. Would you uh, Would you like to present? Or are you just going to talk? Uh, floor is yours. Okay. Um, you know, my budget uh, year to year is pretty basic. It doesn't go up a lot. Um, as you can see, um, for this period, it's only up uh, 2.1%. Um, there are areas, especially in the uh, elections budget, that require some additional funding based on uh, the proposed changes to election laws that'll be coming up uh, for 2022. Uh, the plan that we're hearing, although it has, hasn't passed uh, the legislature yet, is that they're gonna institute all of the uh, 2020 election changes that were brought in through the pan pandemic. So that would include uh, additional in-person early voting, as well as by law voting. Uh, so we, we can anticipate all the uh, postage costs that we had before would, would um, be there again. So I asked for an additional 5,000 in um, the postage costs for the election department, as well as uh, over time for the election workers, uh, we have a, an election in September and November. So it's gonna require early voting in person and early voting by mail. Uh, so those are the, the big changes as far as the uh, town clerk side of it. Uh, as far as salaries, we're you know right at the 2% right now. Uh, and as far as the uh, administrative expenses for that department, I think there was just one office equipment uh, increase for $500 based on uh, maintenance plans for our uh, different software programs that we use in the office. And there's some additional uh, office equipment maintenance for the election equipment. Uh, maintenance uh, programs that we have for the two different types of equipment that we use. Other than that, it's pretty straightforward and, and pretty much a straight line, uh, no increases. All right, I appreciate that. Um, Dennis, do you have anything you, you wanna add? Uh, I believe you were the liaison for this. Yeah, no, uh, we went over this pretty thoroughly uh, with, with Bob and, uh, you know, we, we didn't find anything um, <clears throat> to suggest that there was anything meaningful to, to cut back on or anything like that. Okay, all right, cool. Not the, not the season to start cutting back on, on election expenses. <laughs> For sure. Jack, go ahead. Yeah, um, a, a question for Bob on, uh, you've observed elections now for, uh, I'll say 20 years, long time anyway. Yeah. Um, and we have proposals for early voting and mail-in voting. To what extent does that increase the percentage, or, or the, let me just say the number of voters, is it a 5% increase? Uh, uh, what, what? 
Yeah, historically, for the early voting, there hasn't really been any increase in the voter turnout. Um, 2020 is an outlier because it was such a, uh, I don't want to know the proper word for it, but it was very contentious election uh, in 2020. So um, you had uh, a, an increase in the presidential election, but uh, realistically, it was only like a two or three percent increase from the other uh, presidential elections that uh, I've ever uh, seen. So, uh, in, in Foxborough, anyways, it really wasn't much of an increase. Um, there was an increase in the primary in September, um, but that was because the Secretary of State's office sent out postcards to every single voter. I imagine. You probably got one at your own home. Anyone that was registered in Massachusetts was sent a postcard application for by mail voting. So uh, there was an increase for that uh, particular election. Uh, but overall, uh, historically, we've seen uh, no real increase in voter turnout due to the by, by mail voting. Does that, does that answer your question, Jack? All right, very cool. Uh, any further questions for Bob? Okay, thanks, quick and easy. Great, all right, have a great night, everybody. Yeah, you as well. Uh, so the last line item I have on the agenda is voting on the approval of prior meeting, meeting minutes. Um, I know Paul sent them out uh, for everyone's review on Sunday night. I didn't hear anything back, so I assume that means all of you read them and you agree with them. Awesome. Sweet. Uh, so uh, I'm going to go first with the February 2nd minutes. Um, do I have a motion uh, to approve the February 2nd minutes? I make a motion to approve the February 2nd ADCOM minutes. Mm -hmm. Second. All right, I have a second. All in favor, please raise your hands high. Okay, that's unanimous. Uh, any against? Okay, wonderful. Now we'll do the February 9th minutes. Oh, yeah. Do I have a motion for the approval of the February 9th minutes? February 9th. I'll make so a motion moved. again to, appro to approve the February 9th ADCOM minutes. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second from Jack, wonderful. All in favor, raise your hands. Hi. Aye. Any opposed? And any abstentions? I have an abstention. Awesome. Okay. Uh, that is approved. Uh, I don't have anything else uh, on the agenda. Um, so uh, does anyone, would anyone like up? Oh, Raphael, do you have something? I, I do have a question. I Paul sent sure. out an email today about uh, the warrants. And I was just wondering on the zoning warrants that we may have to vote on again, can we use the same write ups or do we have to make a, a, you know, do something different on those or should they be exactly the same? Um, the I, My understanding is you, you probably could make an edit if you wanted to. Um, I don't think we will be required to. I think we'll probably okay. just need to update them for the correct dates and, and things okay. like that. But I don't, I don't think we need to take it any okay. farther than that. Okay. I would agree with that, Dan. I, I don't think there's any reason to, uh, to change any of the, uh, the actual language. It's the same. The action is just, a, it's just, a, it was a technical issue in the, in the decision right. uh, and, the, and the process more than anything. So it wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with the actual um, information contained in the articles themselves. Correct. Yep. We should know by March 8th, by the way, if that is in fact going to happen, if, if we need to include them in the warrant or not. That's the latest information that Bob has been trying to 
get out of uh, the attorney general's office. Okay. So that, okay. Any other questions, comments, concerns? I do have another question, just so I'm sure. uh, Absolutely. So on March 2nd, next Wednesday, we'll just be speaking about all of the different presentations and departments going through the budget ourselves or no? Or maybe warrants? Will that come up next? Um, so, I do believe Paul did, sends out something about that. Go ahead, Bill. Okay. Dan, I, I, I did uh, see something from Paul today, and, he's, he's, and I, I need to follow up with him tomorrow on some of those things because I did. Uh, uh, um, actually include uh, Leah Gibson in some of those and Leah's away this week so I, uh, I'm going to follow up with her as well as Paul to, to coordinate the, the schedule for those things so we can uh, make sure we have the right people in place for the presentations um, we, uh, none of us really know the individuals uh, who, who submitted the, uh, the citizens petitions mm -hmm. uh, so, so I, I'm going to refer back to Bob because they were submitted to him and see if we can get the names of those individuals and then reach out to them directly to see if they want to come in and make the presentation to your committee. But um, as far as the, uh, the, like the marijuana, the, the, the billboard issues, the, uh, the, the door to door sales, the, um, and the changing the select, uh, selectmen to the select board. Uh, those were all things that, that the selectmen and myself will be working with. Uh, I believe on the billboards will be ZBA chairman as well. And, the, and perhaps the planning board on the marijuana issue as well. So we'll be uh, working uh, jointly with, with a couple boards to, to make those presentations on, on those items. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, and and to to what Bill just said, that that is those the ones the Warren articles that Bill just listed are the ones that Paul had listed um, for next Wednesday for March second. Um, so it looks like Warren articles will be our our topic. Um, and then okay. I believe the budget. I think we'll be, it looks like we'll be doing Warren articles um, March 2nd and, and March 9th, and then we'll get into the uh, the budget. Uh, it looks like that's Paul's plan. Okay. So. okay. We'll also be working on the capital plan in between that uh, on Saturday the 5th, if I'm not mistaken, Dan. Is it, the, is it March 5th, I think? I think uh, so, yes. Yeah. It's a Saturday, I think. It's a Saturday we'll be doing that. So, and that that will be uh, Paul will be participating in that, that uh, representing the committee on that part of it. Yep. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anything else? Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Do I have a second? I'll second it. All right. All in favor? Hi. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. We'll have See Paul back week. to lead you next week. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right, thanks for all your help.